Built for structured logging, Seek lets you filter and exclude events by type, search by event properties, build dashboards, and configure alerts in seconds. Seek helps you troubleshoot and resolve issues more efficiently than ever before. Available as a simple Windows installer or Docker image, try Seek for free now at datalust.co slash seq. That's datalust.co slash seq. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. Sanjana Curtis. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department at the University of Chicago. How are you? I am great. Uh, you know, it's Friday. Looking forward to the weekend. It is Friday, and it is exciting. So I found you on uh, social media. You are not only a postdoctoral researcher, but you're also a science educator. You put yourself out there in public. And I also watched a couple of your YouTubes where you were talking about the work that you're doing on the origin of elements. And this sent me down a rabbit hole. And I assume <laughs> that rabbit hole is your entire life, figuring out where elements come from. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I kind of stumbled onto the research topic, to be honest. I went into my physics program just wanting to study things like gender relativity and eventually found the astrophysicists. And uh, a lot of uh, the work that I'm doing, it's all under the umbrella of nuclear astrophysics. And that is exactly what you said, the origin of elements in the periodic table. Uh, what are the astrophysical sites? What are the processes that created them? In your video that I watched where you were giving a lecture on the topic, you sp kind of split the um, periodic table in half. And there's like the lighter elements and then there's the heavier mm -hmm. elements. Something kind of magical happens in the middle and we understand all the things to the left and we don't understand all the things to the right. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. There's actually a lot of different ways in which elements are made in a lot of different places. And so uh, the, the whole periodic table thing that we're doing, splitting it in half is maybe not quite the right way to go about it, but it's more like there's what's called Big Bang nucleosynthesis that makes the lightest elements of the periodic table. So hydrogen, helium, a bit of lithium. Then there's stars and supernova, and they create a lot of the elements all the way up to iron or even zinc. And then there's special kinds of processes that you need in order to make elements that are heavier than zinc. You need to capture neutrons. And so for that, then in comes uh, something like a neutron star merger. So two neutron stars ripping each other apart, colliding, creating a lot of heat and creating new elements. And so I think those in my mind are the broad classifications of the periodic table. So then we, we see people trying to like make hydrogen or take water apart into its component parts. And those things are fairly small and simple. And there's a lot of conversation around that. But something like a gold or an iron is like, it's pretty complicated. And there's a lot going on there. We just can't make that in a lab, right? That would be alchemy, would it not? <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, that would be alchemy. And the thing is the, the sort of conditions that you need, like the temperatures and the densities, to basically bombard an atom with a lot of neutrons. Those are the kind of conditions that are uh, produced in astrophysical systems and, and difficult to replicate, if not impossible, on Earth. Yeah, when they say difficult to replicate on Earth, I always think about, uh, they talk about the temperatures that they need. And I'm like, are they going to make a star on the planet? Because that would, <laughs> that would like blow it all up, right? Like, are there certain properties we just simply cannot recreate because we're on a big ball of iron already? Well, you can do you can do a smaller scale thing, right? Like you can have a target at an accelerator facility and you can bombard that target with some other atom. So some particular atom whose properties you're trying to measure and you can bombard it with, say, a different smaller atom and you can measure those things. But but yeah, creating a star is not something we're going to be able to do on Earth. No. One of the things that I, ha I have, um, I'm trying to get my head around as a lay person is that we do these things, these events, whether it be something like two stars like colliding at a large scale or two atoms colliding in a, in a, in something that we did as an accelerator. And then they always say, and it lasted one millisecond or half of a millisecond or negative, you know, 
So there was an event that you studied, the GW17817 event. Is that two stars that collided? Yes. So GW17817, that's this gravitational wave event and a multi-messenger event. What that means is that we detected from the merger of two neutron stars, gravitational waves, which are ripples in space-time that traveled to Earth and were measured at facilities like LIGO and Virgo. So these are gravitational wave observatories specially built for this purpose. And along with that, there was a short gamma ray burst, so a particular type of electromagnetic signal that was also detected by telescopes. And a, yet, uh, another signal that's called a kilonova, and that's a signature of heavy elements being produced. So heavy elements, now I'm talking about these elements that require neutron capture in this event. And so the kilonova signal, another electromagnetic signal. So we got these gravitational waves, we got the kilonova, and we got the GRB. And so that's why it's such an exciting event, because these are kind of different pieces of a puzzle. And then you put them together and you get a, get a fuller picture of what actually happened in a neutron star merger. Is it fair to say, though, that this only happened for like uh, 100 seconds? So I'm trying to understand the event. The signal was 100 seconds. The thing, the dilation, the time dilation of how far away these things, 130 million light years away. So I'm trying to get my head around the idea that this happened already, right? Yes. So this happened already. And then it took a whole lot of time for the signals to propagate all the way to Earth. And then uh, we were lucky enough to detect them. That's right. But, you know, in a sense, like the neutron stars spiraling towards each other, that was going on for, you know, millions of years. And then eventually when they got close enough together, the gravitational wave signal that we have, that's like a short signal, it's called a chirp. That is really a record of this violent merger that happened once they were close enough together. That's the strong signal you would actually see in LIGO. Why is the chirp not a couple of hundred thousand years long, or even a couple of months. By the time these neutron stars get so close to each other, this merger, the final steps of the merger, that happens very quickly. So, you know, you have all this gravitational wave emission as the stars finally merge together, and then they form some sort of temporarily stable object, maybe a black hole, and then things quiet down and ring down from there. So so this big burst of gravitational waves is what you're capturing, like this very violent few milliseconds or whatever of the merger itself. So we just happen to be looking in the right direction or we're always looking in the right direction? Oh, that's a great question. So to some extent, we're always looking with the gravitational wave observatories I'm a more of a theory side, so I, I might not 100% be saying this correctly, but the issue of localization, which is what you're really getting at, is how do we know we got a gravitational wave signal? How do we know where exactly it came from? And then how do we know where to point our telescopes to follow up on the electromagnetic stuff that I was talking about? And so with these gravitational wave detectors, there's a few detectors. There's LIGO, there's Virgo, there's another one called COGRA, I believe. And so when you get a signal at or not at these different observatories, that helps you kind of triangulate the part of the sky where something happened. And then, uh, you know, you can comb that part of the sky with other telescopes to see if you see something that looks coincident with the gravitational waves in that region. So it's actually a very non-trivial process to really find where something came from. Is it the equivalent of me going, I think I hear something, and then trying to turn my head and figure out where, in what direction I was? I heard that? And then maybe I'll hear it a little bit again? And your friend says, yeah. And your friend says, hey, from over there, right? And so um. kind of you come to your... Uh, <laughs> come to this common area that you find that both of you agree on. I see. So then everyone starts looking in that direction. Everyone, all eyes, all, uh, all measurements go there. But this happened in August of 2017. What if I wanted to start studying it today in 2023? What if the next, you know, Dr. Sanjana Curtis is just being born and they want to learn about it? Do they just have to download a file or what is the artifact of that event? Because it's happened already. Basically, most of the data collection for that particular event has already happened. So you can only capture a little 
part of the larger gravitational wave signal just because of how sensitivity of detectors works and so so on and so forth. So the merger has already happened. The gravitational wave signal has already been captured. Now, the light that I talked about, short gamma ray bursts, they don't last very long either. Uh, but there is an afterglow sometimes from these kind of electromagnetically bright events that lasts for a while, sometimes maybe uh, weeks to months. I think for since this was almost oof, more than five years ago now, a lot of that stuff has faded. Um, so whatever, most of the measurements that were going to happen for this event have happened. But there's a lot of hope for whoever is being born at this moment and is interested in this topic because, you know, we're not done yet. This was just one event and a very lucky uh, set of circumstances that helped us actually find it and observe it so well. LIGO, Virgo, all these gravitational wave observatories are still operational. They're still looking out there. They've detected other mergers. The trick is to find also, in addition to the gravitational waves, this electromagnetically like light, light from the event. That's the trick. And that has not happened a second time yet. But it could in the future. And there's a lot of telescopes online. LIGO is about to start their next observing run. We might find something else. And we're going to keep finding these, I feel. Maybe not quite in quite so much beautiful detail as the GW170817. But there's a lot of hope to study like a population of these rather than just the one event. Right. Because like, I guess one is like not data. It's just, it's not an anecdote, but it's like, if we had 20 of these, then we could do all kinds of things. Right. Then it's a bigger picture of exactly what's going on. But the one event, like it helps you put constraints, but the more statistics you have, the better, the better, you know, the story. Yeah. So you mentioned light in that, uh, in what you just said, which is important because if I understand correctly, light has to do with what's emitted, what's ejected from this material. And I thought it was really interesting that the terms red and blue are used. And when I heard red and blue, again, as a lay person, I'm like, oh, Doppler shift, not that, totally different thing. What does the colors red and blue have to do with the material that was ejected from the merger of those stars? That's a wonderful question, and it's very interesting, but it will take a couple of steps to walk through. Basically, when we talk about red and blue, we're specifically talking about the kilonova signal. Mm -hmm. The kilonova signal comes from basically radioactive decay of unstable elements that are being created in this event, heating up material that's ejected from the event. Whether something is red or blue depends on the composition of the material that was ejected from the event. And the way it works is there's a certain class of nuclei called lanthanides. They're lanthanide-like, heavier elements, basically. And if you produce these elements, they tend to absorb light on the bluer side of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you have light coming from an event, you've created lanthanides which are absorbing the blue part of the light. So what's left is the light at longer wavelengths, the light that's red. And if you don't create these elements, then what you get is a blue uh, signal. So that's the difference between red and blue. And so all of that is really to say that you're probing the composition of the material by probing the spectrum of the light that's coming from the event. Okay. If it's shifted towards the red, it means that certain types of heavy isotopes were created in the event. Okay, so then if I understand correctly, we're looking at, we're observing this gravitational wave event and the things that are coming from it, including this kilonova, and there's this change of color that's observed, which is really not a change of color, but a change of movement in the electrical, electromagnetic spectrum. And in doing that, we're like, hang on a second, that corresponds to these things on the periodic table. There must be a bunch of that stuff floating out there. Exactly, exactly, yes. Okay, Getting to that from sort of the modeling side of things is, of course, you know, it's been years and years of work that people have put in to really figure out what would something look like, um, uh, what would a kilonova look like from an event just like the one we observed. So there's a lot of modeling and a lot of like hundreds of uh, things that people try and uh, discard as hypotheses and then you settle on, okay, no, this is real. This is really what we saw. Yeah. Interesting. The thing I keep coming back to is the juxtaposition between the scope of how big and far apart everything is, 
whether it be big and far apart from a time perspective, like I'm having trouble getting my brain around 130 million light years and something yes. lasted 100 seconds, like yeah. know, something that occurred over all of creation, the time of all creation, but we, you know, a chirp happened. And then in this context, there's a bunch of elements floating around, or at least they were 130 million years ago. And uh-huh. at some point, and help me out here, they're going to land here and then I'm going to buy them and put them on my wife's finger <laughs> for, <laughs> you know, for right. Valentine's Day. I, I yeah. they're kind of like, you lost me at that point. You're saying that all of these heavy elements are not from here because nothing is from here. It's all from stars crashing into each other. That's right. That's right. Isn't that incredible? I mean, like you and I and the whole world is made of this star stuff. I mean, as Carl Sagan said, and everybody repeats, but it is true. I mean, it's kind of an incredible thing to think about. Now, of course, the gold on Earth or whatever is not from the neutron star merger that we observed, but from something similar to that. That's what we have to figure out, basically. Oh, you know, having seen this one merger, how much gold was produced? How often do these events happen? So then in that way, we take those numbers, we compare to what we find in the solar system, and then we say, you know what? Probably neutron star mergers made all of the gold in the universe. Maybe they didn't. Uh, Maybe there's other possible uh, sites where similar things happen. This episode of Hansel Minutes is brought to you by Partner Hero. Partner Hero provides customer service outsourcing that's built for the needs of scaling and high-growth startups. They offer flexible terms, fast onboarding, and the ability to scale teams quickly, which is great for fast-growing businesses. Now, in the past, outsourcing has had a bad reputation for being exploitative or somewhat you know, low quality, but Partner Hero's values-based approach really raises the bar. They pay above market salaries, they have a focus on quality and performance, and unlike most business process outsourcing companies, their management team includes individuals from the startup world, so they're more than just a service provider. They're a thought partner for the startups that they serve. They've got flexible terms, they've got offices around the world, so they have truly global coverage, including onshore, nearshore, and offshore options. Now, outsourcing has long been available to many big enterprises, but Partner Hero is challenging businesses as usual with short, flexible contracts and fast ramp-up times. If you're ready to bring in outside customer support help for your startup that feels like it's a part of your existing team, check out Partner Hero. Head on over to partnerhero.com slash Hansel Minutes to book a free consultation with their solutions team. Mention that you heard about Partner Hero from Hansel Minutes and they'll waive the setup fee. That's partnerhero.com slash Hansel Minutes. You mentioned lanthanides, these these chemical elements within a specific range of atomic numbers. Uh, and I assume that other ranges have different names and you're kind of thinking all right, but these are lanthanides and these mergers make usually this kind of thing and these make the noble gases. I don't know. But the point being that the rare earth, they're rare earth elements because they're rare. They had to come from somewhere. Is the amount of gold and rare earth elements on the earth finite? Like we have what we have and when we're out of lithium, we're out of lithium. That is correct. Yeah. I think that's something we should actually really keep in mind uh, as we exploit the finite amount of resources that we have on this planet. And you can always try to produce things artificially, but the quantities that we need them in for the type of tech that we're making, that's not really going to work for us. So we have to be very careful how we're uh, using you know, the lithium, for example. Yeah, that's really that's really fascinating. It makes me wonder kind of what the ethical and social implications are. Like once we discover that okay, here are the kinds of stars that crash into each other and here are the things that come out of them. And now we know it's only this event that makes this thing that's in your phone or in your electric car. And that's rare. And we don't know if it's rare, right? Does, is it rare or not rare? How often are stars crashing into each other? So it, it's fairly rare as far as these things go. Um, over the history of the universe, things happen in different ways. So it's possible that there were other types of, say, supernova or exploding stars that also made these same elements that we're talking about coming from a neutron star merger sort of earlier in the history of the universe. And then kind of neutron star mergers took over and they started producing these elements and the stars kind of died and are not doing production of uh, gold, for example, in the same way. Uh, but yeah, they're they're fairly rare events. That's uh, one of the things that we, uh, just from observations, we have a sense of. Does the abstractness of this 
ever get to you or stress you out? Because I went through your your paper <laughs> and your PhD thesis, and I went through papers that you've written yeah. on this topic, and. I have to admit that, you know, other than like a picture or two, it turns into graphs and charts very quickly. And I was curious, like, I, the, the analogy yeah. that I'll give is that I, <laughs> I, I had an interview recently with a chess master who made chess.com. And he told me he can close his eyes and he can see the board and you can just tell him letters and numbers and the board appears on his head. So he and his buddy will sit in the car <laughs> on long road trips and just say letters and numbers and they're playing chess. At what point, like, has that happened to oh you? Like, because I'm still trying to get my head around this, but I suspect you have some visualizations that you're able to do simply by looking at a chart and saying, look at that, look at that third peak. That's where the gold happened. Yeah, I mean, for sure, it kind of becomes part of your, you know, subconscious processing at some point, And you forget that uh, when you look at a graph, what it says to you immediately might be completely incomprehensible to anybody else who looks at it. The abstractness of it does not get to me, to be honest. I enjoy it. I've always liked kind of more of trying to understand how things work and where they come from has been a driving force in my life. And so there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of fuzziness. I enjoy it. Are there moments of of eureka? <laughs> like it's funny that we're talking about Eureka yes. in the context of discovering things in gold. And then uh, we think about, you know, contact and things where Jodie Foster and everyone's sitting in Mexico in a tiny observatory and then they see a signal and that's the moment. Have you had a moment like that? Have I had a moment like that? I have, I've had very tiny Eureka moments, like, you know, just in the course of the research. But I would say I had a I had one just a couple of weeks ago. I can't tell you more about it yet because that's going to be my next paper. <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, I've definitely seen, you know, a grass and gone, we've got it. You know, this is it. This makes sense. Yeah, those moments are really rare and precious. How do um, astrophysicists in your community, because I know you have a community, how do you communicate? I'm a software <laughs> person, so we we live in Discord and and Twitter. Like, are you talking about these things on social media or is there a secret Discord <laughs> or is it all just papers and PDFs? Um, there's a lot of collaborate uh, collaborations. So, um, at least for the gravitational wave astronomers, for example, they are all part of the LIGO Virgo collaboration, and they all interact uh, presumably with each other. I don't know what format they use, but a lot of astrophysics is big collaborations. Um, for example, um, in nuclear astrophysics, uh, there's what's called what's called like the Joint Institute for Nuclear Astrophysics at Michigan State. And then uh, they have this network called the IRENA network. And so it's full of people who are like me trying to understand different parts of this puzzle. And uh, we get to talk to each other at conferences and, and stuff like that. Uh, there's no Discord or any of that. But, you know, there's always people on Twitter talking about whatever's happening and what they're thinking about. And so there's, there's actually a fairly active astrophysics community on Twitter. Yeah, so that that's kind of it, like the collaborations, uh, the big meetings that happen, people posting their papers on archive, which is uh, the more formal end of this thing, and uh, a lot of the chatter that just happens on Twitter. Yeah. How how much how how old is this science? Well, because I know that people have been looking at the stars since they were stars, right. but the actual like corpus of of science in this space. Like when you joined, you know, I don't know how long you've been in the, in the, in the industry, but you must have had a couple hundred years to catch up on. Uh, actually not so many years. So, um, I forget the exact year, but one of the big papers that are, that's the foundational paper for the field that I'm in is called, uh, B squared FH. That's like Burbage, Burbage, Fowler and Hoyle. Uh, and it's about uh, synthesis of elements in stars. And that's where they kind of summarize the research and conversation that was happening presumably over the last couple of decades. And they kind of laid out this uh, landscape of how elements are created through different processes in different astrophysical events. And so that was kind of uh, an outline. And then people built upon that outline and really started to uh, to see if it works, uh, if the different uh, processes that they proposed actually happen in nature, uh, if the different events they propose can actually produce the elements that 
they're claiming they might produce. So that was kind of, um, I want to say, 1950s. Wow, really? So then there's people thinking about, you know, chemical element origins in the 40s, and there's early stuff thinking about it in the 20s. But basically, the 20th century was the golden again, no pun intended, <laughs> time for, for yeah. astrophysics. So you have 100 years to catch up on, years, yeah. and now you feel like you're, and you're in there. So that if I was going to join, or this, this theoretical person who uh, is being born right now wants to start, yeah. they, they don't necessarily have thousands and thousands of years to catch they up on. They do not. Only 100 years, okay. easy. Only 100, <laughs> yeah, only 100 years. Only 100 years of the collective knowledge of the human That's race. That's right. Totally <laughs> Just thousands of papers, it's easy. <laughs> So I have a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old, and anytime they hear science, they think math and calculus. And I'm curious, as someone who, I mean, I got as far as calculus. Yeah. What's the math situation here? What's the thing that keeps people from doing your job? Oof. Uh, you do need to have a, a somewhat comfort with math, at least. You know, uh, you, you can't be scared of it and do my job. Um, there's a lot of... So what it re what my day to day really boils down to is uh, I'm a computational astrophysicist. So a lot of the work that I do is coding, and it's coding up physical equations, equations like you know uh, general relativity, and um, solving them on a computer. Um, the nuclear reactions that I talk about, you know, you write up code to solve matrices. Uh, and figure out uh, uh, basically what kind of elements are made that way. That's what I mean when I say theoretical computational astrophysics. And so you do need to have a handle on basically uh, basic calculus, at least, and then on top of that, some sense of computing and uh, uh, numerical methods. Uh, and for some people, this is fun. For some people, not so much, right? Uh, my advisor always said that um, every job has kind of a part that you don't enjoy. Uh, so maybe the part that you don't enjoy is running into these obscure bugs that take months to solve. And then when you finally figure it out, your code runs, but you've spent months solving a very tiny technical issue. And she always said that there's going to be parts you don't enjoy. You have to make sure that you're kind of like good at them. So you, you can at least get through them as quickly as you can and move on to the fun part. I, I learned recently that there's some software that is used, I believe, by computational astrophysicists that's called Skynet. And yes. with the rise of AI right now, it's pretty <laughs> scary that we've decided to name it that. I'm not really ha not a fan of that name, but is, is that literally, it's just, it's C++ open source software. Is, is that at the heart of what you're doing? Skynet is, uh, is a big part of it. There's, there's many open source codes. Um, the trick is knowing how to really use them. And uh, some of them, you know, it, it's all physics built in. But you still need to know how to apply it to a problem in a sensible way, in a way that actually leads to an accurate result. So, for example, one of the big codes in the community is the Einstein Toolkit. You can download it and you can today run uh, a simulation of two neutron stars merging together on your MacBook. But then to do kind of like the next step calculations, which we need to get accurate answers like scientific level of computing then you need to go to the high performance computing facilities and you need to apply for supercomputer time that kind of thing interesting okay so you're you could be like for example in airplane mode yeah. on an airplane no internet access yeah and do a tiny you star see, simulation yeah. and then land and be like that's amazing now we'll bring the cloud now we'll get azure now we'll get whatever yeah. to like chew on that for real yeah absolutely <laughs> That's amazing. And and this this Skynet, just as an example, this nuclear reaction library, network library. Yeah. It, you can take this concept of what's called R process nucleosynthesis. Nucleosynthesis. Nucleosynthesis, yeah. How, what is nucleosynthesis as it relates to fusion? Because they sound like the same thing. I mean, fusion is a, uh, is a subset of the processes that you think about when you think about nucleosynthesis. But yeah, nucleosynthesis basically, uh, you know, hydrogen fusing to helium, for example, is nu nucleosynthesis, but also neutron capture on a nucleus is nucleosynthesis. Nucleosynthesis is just like a catch-all term for mm -hmm. producing a new nucleus from existing nuclei. 
And once these things have merged, they're, 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 are they stable or are they not stable? Because you had implied before when the ejecta happens, some things get made, but they may not stick around for a while. That's right. like, ah, for, yeah. And then it's gone. Yeah, yeah. But, then, but the gold that we have does stick around. A lot of the elements that are produced are unstable, actually, largely unstable. And then they decay and uh, eventually get to things like gold, for example. Like in a supernova, for example, that's that's kind of a simpler example of this where the light curve of a supernova is powered by a radioactive uh, element. Again, it's nickel-56. That's the radioactive thing that uh, produces largely the light curve of a supernova. Uh, the nickel-56 decays because it's not stable. It decays and it forms iron. So uh, that's kind of the connection. Uh, the unstable stuff decays, but it produces something else that's stable, that sticks with us. And why is it... And this is a dumb question, and like most of my questions are dumb, as you can probably tell. Uh, why is it a valid element if it doesn't stick around very long? Like, how long does it have to stick around before you go, yeah, that was a thing, I'm going to name it, versus, no, that's a transitory, that's a, that's, a, that's a momentary element. It's not real. It's not like I can make a ring out of this. Thing. Right, right. Uh, that is not at all a stupid question. Um, you kind of have to keep an eye on, like, the half-life of the nucleus, I guess, and occasionally it does happen that the nucleus is not stable, but it just has such a long half-life that it's effectively going to stick around for a very long time. Um, like uh, it's not going to turn into something else for a very, very long time. And those are called metastable uh, nuclei, so uh, isotopes, for example. So it, it's not like a very clear-cut line. It just depends on, you know, most of the things that our world is made of are not radioactive. They've already had plenty of time to settle into whatever they were going to be. But then there, there are radioactive elements that are what's called metastable. And so they might still be around and still be radioactive. That's the thing. Again, we keep coming back to there's things that last for milliseconds or even fractions no. of milliseconds. And there's things that last yeah. forever. Even iron, like, oh, yeah, nickel, this will last 75,000 years which is really not that long. Yeah. Long enough for me to make something in my house, but not long enough cosmologically. And then something else might just be a blink of an eye and it doesn't exist for very long. No, you you are really touching on one of one of the key things in astrophysics really, like the problem of scales, you know, we are looking at short to very long time scales like you're saying, we're we're thinking of milliseconds and we're thinking of the lifetime of the universe. We're also thinking of, in nuclear astrophysics, we're thinking of these events like a supernova. I mean, the energy output of that kind of event, it's its enormous. But we're also thinking of subatomic particles in the supernova. So we really, uh, you really have to understand all of this to truly create a picture of the universe that makes sense. And that's one of the things that pulled me into nuclear astrophysics is seeing that every piece of physics that I had learned up until that point needed to be put together in a meaningful way to understand a supernova. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Curtis, for chatting with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a really fun conversation. We've been chatting with Dr. Sanjana Curtis. He's a postdoctoral researcher and a computational astrophysicist at the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department at the University of Chicago. You can check her out online, and I hope that you check out another episode of Hansel Minutes. We'll see you again next week.